this really nice workshop. And thanks everyone else for tuning in. So today I'm really excited to tell you about some work I did uh, recently on dark matter in exoplanets. So this is work I did together with another postdoc, Yuri Smirnov, who's at Ohio State. So what I want to show you today is that exoplanets are new, exciting, and very powerful detectors of dark matter. So how can we think about how dark matter can come to be in exoplanets and how can we detect it? The general sort of picture is that we have dark matter that's a particle that exists in the galactic halo and it has some velocity as it's um, speeding around and it can come into contact with exoplanets. So dark matter can hit the exoplanet material, it can lose energy as it scatters and it can become gravitationally captured. So over time you end up getting more and more dark matter in the core of these exoplanets and if you have a lot of dark matter it can start to annihilate if it's an annihilating type of dark matter. So you start getting standard model products that are being produced inside the exoplanet and these products are then absorbed by the planet. So the overall temperature of the exoplanet increases uh, such that it then will emit in infrared more than it would have if dark matter wasn't scattering um, and then annihilating and heating the planet. So this is the signal that we want to look for. We want to look for planets that are overheated by dark matter. So you might have heard of these sorts of signals before where you have dark matter captured in some sort of celestial object. And if you have, or even if you haven't heard of this, you might be wondering why exoplanets? Why would we choose exoplanets as our target? Turns out exoplanets are actually highly advantageous as a search target for dark matter. So the first of these reasons is that we have an exploding research program searching for exoplanets. So actually, not even 30 years ago, we didn't know that exoplanets even actually necessarily existed. And almost all the exoplanets we know now, we only actually found in the last 10 years. And of those, almost all of them were found in the last five years. So clearly this is a very quickly growing program. And there are a lot of discoveries and a lot of things we're going to learn about these exoplanets in the coming years. So there are a lot of telescopes that are trying to find exoplanets, measure their properties and learn a lot about them. Um, but there are also many upcoming telescopes and new searches. So what I've shown in orange is just a very short list of some of these telescopes, but there are many that are going to find lots of things that are very interesting. So we really have ample motivation to consider all the new ways that this exploding research program can be used to probe new physics. The second advantage is just statistics. So we think that there are about 300 billion exoplanets in our galaxy, which is a really big number. So of course, while we're not going to find all of these exoplanets immediately, even a tiny fraction of hundreds of billions of exoplanets are going to give us fantastic statistics. We want to understand, is there really a dark matter signal there? Or is it just some other systematic that we don't properly understand? So to date, we've found nearly 5,000 exoplanets that are confirmed. And there's about an additional 5,000 on top of that that are candidates that um, everyone's still looking into. So compared to just using, for example, Jupiter, which we have in our solar system, is only one data point, we can instead use the whole ensemble, all like these really large catalogs of exoplanets to try and look for something that looks anomalous. The third advantage are the really low temperatures of exoplanets. At least they can be at very low temperatures. And the reason why they can be very cold is that they do not undergo nuclear fusion. So there's no fusing of um, hydrogen into helium, like sort of stars you might think about, and these really low temperatures can allow for a clearer signal over background for dark matter heating. So we really just want dark matter heating to try and take over as the dominant um, heat source for the planet. Also, they can have really low core temperatures compared to, for example, something like our sun. So this is in part responsible for the dark matter evaporation limit actually extending much further down in dark matter mass. So this means we actually have sensitivity to much lighter, so sub GeV sort of dark matter. And this is just because if you have lower temperatures, uh, you have less kinetic energy being imparted into the dark matter particles so they don't just leave the star. So we have good sensitivity to lighter dark matter candidates if we use exoplanets compared to, for example, the sun. A fourth advantage is just their size. So compared to some other targets, they're just enormous. So I actually tried to show you to scale something like a Jupiter, um, which is this giant thing in the corner and, and a neutron star. And you might notice you can't see the neutron star. Um, that is because it's about one pixel compared to the size of this Jupiter. Um, now, one of the other sort of really promising signals that's had a lot of attention recently is dark matter heating neutron stars. 
So while that's a really exciting signal, and maybe we will see that in the near future, uh, it potentially is a more difficult to see signal compared to looking at exoplanets. So a neutron star has a radius of about 10 kilometers across. These uh, Jupiters have about 70,000 kilometers in radius. So they're really big objects. And of course, the luminosity of these objects scales with the surface area. So they're much brighter. Um, they're also much more easy to find, not just because they're bigger and more luminous, um, but also because they actually outnumber neutron stars by a factor of at least about 1,000. Okay, so it seems like we have lots of good reasons to look at exoplanets as dark matter detectors. Um, so what type of exoplanets exactly do we have in mind when we want to do this search? So there are a few different types of exoplanets. So one, one is just um, exoplanets that are like our Earth or a super Earth, which is kind of similar, just a little bit heavier and a little bit bigger. These are not ideal for our searches simply because they're smaller than other types of exoplanets and we don't really gain in any other way. So if we wanted to look at, say, just another Earth that was towards the center of the galaxy, it's going to be too small for us to see with our telescope. So we want something bigger. And the something bigger, which is ideal, is something like our Jupiter. So these are just called Jupiters in general. So these are quite a common type of exoplanet or super Jupiters, which from the name you figure out, they're just like Jupiter, but a bit bigger. Uh, another ideal type of exoplanet, if you would call it an exoplanet, are brown dwarfs. So technically, brown dwarfs often are given their own sort of classification, but you can think about them as kind of um, the thing that exists between planets and stars. Uh, for our purposes, we're including brown dwarfs as a category of um, exoplanets. So brown dwarfs, if you haven't come across them before, are really dense. So they can be, once they've cooled off, about the size of Jupiter, but their mass is about an order of magnitude higher. So same size, more mass packed in, very dense. That's great. That means it's got a bigger sort of gravitational well, so it can capture more dark matter. So these are great for our searches. They can be quite cool as well. And another sort of broad class of exoplanets that we really like for our searches are called rogue planets. So these are also called free floating planets. These planets are totally um, alone. So they're all cold. Um, they're, they're not born necessarily. They don't necessarily have a home. They might be born in a home and then they're ejected, or they can just form in molecular clouds like stars. So these are really just passing through empty space, uh, cold, alone. So they don't have a parent star at all. They have no other sort of heat pollution. So they're ideal for our searches. They don't have another light pollution uh, source either in terms of just trying to resolve the planet um, if there's a star nearby. So what we want to look at, we want to look at Jupiters, we want to look at brown dwarfs or rogue planets. And rogue planets can cover both Jupiters and brown dwarfs. And in fact, rogue planets often are of the size of Jupiters or brown dwarfs. Okay, so now we have our target exoplanet sort of candidates in mind. How do we calculate what their temperature might be so that we can tell is there a dark metal si signal there or isn't there? So what we want to do is we want to break out the contributions to the temperature um, that might exist. So we can have some contribution coming from the external heat. So for example, if there's a nearby star, then that heat is going to come over and heat the planet up. We can also have internal heat. So within the exoplanet itself, and this comes from things like formation, so it's just left over from when it formed. Or it can also come from burning processes if it's fusing or doing something. The planets that we want to be looking at are not doing nuclear fusion. And we also have some dark matter source. So we're going to add together all these different temperature sources, and then that's going to be our total sort of luminosity. Uh, so this just scales like the radius of the exoplanet that we have. Uh, this is just the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and then we have some temperature to power for. So standard sort of luminosity. This epsilon factor for the purposes of just the talk, I'm setting to one, which means it's just like a black body. Now for the external heat, we're going to assume that this is zero. Uh, and this is a fine assumption, um, but this means that you need exoplanets that are either very far away from their host or they're not bound to any host at all. So like these rogue planets that I just told you about. Um, and these, we want the external heat to be zero just to minimize the sort of backgrounds that we have. In terms of the internal heat, how we deal with that, is we look at simulations that have already been done by exoplanet experts. Um, and this is taking into account these sort of formations or any sort of burning processes that might be happening. Um, and they tell you what you would expect for the internal heat. So we can just take those from papers that exist. And we deliberately want to choose old exoplanets just so they've had the most time to cool. So these are of order about giga years old. And in terms of the dark matter contribution that we have, um, so there are a few different things that are going to be important. I'm just going to really briefly outline what we need. Um, one thing that really is important is the dark matter density throughout the galaxy. So we're going to take three different dark matter density profiles. 
uh, and just kind of vary these to see what the range of expectations might be. So if the plot is just showing you for three different types of dark matter density profiles, you have NFW. This is a generalized NFW, which just means it has a much um, sort of sharper slope. And this Burkett profile is kind of a flat, more of a core towards the center of the galaxy. So we're sitting somewhere over here. So just this is our local dark matter density. Sorry? You just have to wait. It's 10 Perfect, minutes. thank you. Yep. Um, so we're sitting about here and then we're going towards the center of the galaxy. You see the density can increase. So we're gonna put these into our calculation. We also care about things like the dark matter halo velocity and the sort of escape velocities of the exoplanets. So all of those are going to be taken care of. For the, they're all important for the dark matter heating signal. Okay, so we're going to get some dark matter heating signal. How do we detect the signal? So we want to use um, the best infrared telescope uh, that is going to exist, and that is the James Webb Space Telescope. So really excitingly, it's finally about to launch. Hopefully, they've been saying this for a long time. But if all goes as planned, they will launch October of next year. Uh, so the James Webb Space Telescope has infrared sensitivity and it's extremely powerful. Um, so you can see this bottom right here is just comparing the size of the Hubble primary mirror versus James Webb. So it's huge. It's gonna, we're going to learn so much about the universe from James Webb and hopefully we're going to learn a lot about dark matter in exoplanets when it comes online. So the way we calculate the sensitivity using uh, James Webb, they've put up lots of things online that tell you what they expect for its performance. Um, and we look at the different instruments and filters that James Webb has, and we pick the optimal one depending on the prediction that we might have for the dark matter signal. Okay, so here is what we get. Um, so what I'm showing you on the right here is a lot of things at once. Um, so first of all, just on the x-axis, this is the center towards the, sorry, this is the distance towards the center of the galaxy. Um, so on this dotted green line, this is our position at Earth. You know, if you go into the left, you're going in towards the center of the galaxy. The y-axis is showing you the temperature of the exoplanet. Now these dashed, so are these dotted lines are the predictions for the temperature of the planet if there's no dark matter. So this is like the baseline background that you want to compare to. So we've just shown two different temperatures. So this is for 35 Jupiter masses, sorry, two different masses for different sort of candidates of exoplanets. It's totally arbitrary. So 35 Jupiter masses, 55 Jupiter masses, um, this would be the minimum temperature you would expect. Now what you see in the shaded and um, solid line region is just the range of temperatures you expect once dark matter could heat these exoplanets. And this depends on the density profile you have. So as I mentioned earlier, we have this NFW, this generalized NFW, which is the dark matter density, but it's just going up faster towards the center of the galaxy or more of a chord profile with this bucket. Um, now the bottom line corresponds to the lightest type of exoplanet. So this 35, the top line is the 55 for each density category. And if you had some intermediate mass, it would just sit in between one of these lines in the shaded region. Um, so what you see is the dashed line here is the minimum James Webb sensitivity. So James Webb can detect anything above this dashed line, which is exciting because you see that James Webb was capable of actually detecting this signal because you see this sort of uptick of um, predictions in the temperature of the exoplanets. So particularly going towards the center of the galaxy, um, there's something that we can see here. Um, and you might notice that the sensitivity stops around 0.1 kiloparsec. It stops there just, we've been probably a little bit conservative with this. Uh, it just has to do with other backgrounds as you try and move into the center of the galaxy. So we estimated things like stars getting in the way, like stars per pixel, um, and also the sort of scattering you have of dust. In principle, um, it, it might be possible to actually extend this a little bit further in. Okay, um, how's my, yeah. Okay, I might go straight to the next uh, slide. So what we have is a new search for, um, dark matter in exoplanets. And here is actually a plot of what we might actually expect to see if we go looking for this signal. So I showed you the theoretical predictions earlier in the last slide. This shows you here kind of like a mock distribution um, that we've just put together. So if we had um, planets of masses of about uh, 20 to 50 Jupiters, um, you would get something like the black here. So again, the x-axis is the distance towards the center of the galaxy. Y-axis is the temperature. Each black dot here is just a simulated exoplanet that's heated by dark matter. The magenta triangles at the bottom are the same exoplanets with no dark matter heating. And you see that you get very different predictions if whether or not dark matter is present and is heating your exoplanets. And you also see you have this really sharp um, uptick in dark matter heated exoplanets. 
So that's very distinctive and potentially could be used to map the galactic dark matter density. But depending on what profile you have, uh, the shape of all these planets is going to be different moving towards the center of the galaxy. Okay. Um, so the prospects for these searches, um, we've set up this search, we've shown it's possible to detect dark matter this way. There should be lots of exoplanets that um, could reveal the signal to us. And it turns out there are actually many candidates already that do exist. So we're really just waiting for James Webb to come online that we can hopefully see this. Um, so in our paper, we showed, so this is a table on the left, just a number of candidates that are very close by that potentially could reveal some dark matter heating signal. Um, but really importantly, um, there's a number of telescopes coming online that are going to give us um, even more insight to where the exoplanets are and what they might be. So for example, Gaia has predicted they could be able to find about 90,000 planets in our sort of local neighborhood, which is excellent. They can do that. And another telescope called Roman expects to expect at least several thousand exoplanets in the inner galaxy. So we're hopefully going to have a lot of data points for this very soon. And just to quickly show you in terms of the dark matter parameter space, assuming these searches go ahead, we find these exoplanets, what would this tell us about the nature of dark matter? Um, so I'm showing you two plots here for, this is spin dependent dark matter scattering. It also works for independent. I'm just showing you one at a time because it's just easier. Um, what you see for these solid lines. So on the left here, this is the local dark matter velocity. On the right is the galactic center dark matter velocity. Uh, they're separated just because the different velocities end up giving you a different sort of signal. In that if dark matter is moving slower, it gets gravitationally focused into the exoplanet so you can capture more of it, uh, which is the right-hand side scenario. Um, but the, the main point of these figures is that you see comparing to other constraints that do exist, such as this Borexino, which comes from dark matter being boosted from cosmic rays, this DD section, which is direct detection, or just earth heating, which is at the top here, we see that there's a lot of parameter space that this search can fill. In fact, it can actually cover about six orders of magnitude more than existing experiments. Um, so just quickly, depending on what type of exoplanet you have, if you absorb all of the dark matter as you pass it, as it passes through, you'll be on this, oops, sorry. Um, sorry, if the capture rate is at maximal, so it's everything, the highest rate that it could be for the size of the object, you sit at about this black curve. If you have about 10% of the capture rate, it's the dotted curve, the Jupiters. For brown dwarfs, it's further down just because they're bigger and they can capture more. Um, but we see overall, we have pretty good sensitivity compared to uh, experiments that exist. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, the exoplanet program is really rapidly accelerating and there are lots of new su uh, surprises we should expect and there are gonna be different discoveries as well. So what we did in our paper and what I told you about today is, um, we looked at how dark, how exoplanets can be used to discover dark matter. And this is really just due to overheating from captured dark matter particles. And the ideal sort of candidates we found were old cold Jupiters and brown dwarfs. Um, we found that there were actionable discovery or exclusion searches with new uh, infrared telescopes, particularly James Webb, and that the signal that we could find can trace the dark matter density in the galaxy, which is a, a, a pretty neat feature. Uh, we found that there's new sensitivity to the dark matter parameter space so for the dark matter scattering, dark matter proton scattering, it's up to six orders of magnitude stronger than some limits that exist, which is great. So it really covers a new part of parameter space. And there really are a lot of exciting opportunities soon to realize the search. So several telescopes may be informative and we have a new infrared window to dark matter in the inner galaxy. So looking forward now, hopefully James Webb has a successful launch and we'll learn a lot about dark matter in exoplanets. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for the incredibly clear talk. Personally, I'm extremely excited by this research. I was doing things of this kind some time ago. I yeah. think we're basically done with your time because we have 30 seconds left. So probably yeah. I will not take questions uh, and we can stop the next speaker. But I remind you that your talk is fully online and I invite people to uh, contact Rebecca personally. So we're not taking questions at the stage. Can the next speaker get set up with the slides? Rebecca, can you uh, unshare your slides? Mm -hmm. So one thing I forgot to uh, mention in the uh, haste of what happened is that uh, if you can send, if anybody that wants to ask a question sends the question for any speaker to me in a private chat, and if there is time, I will read the selection of them. There was one question for Rebecca, Jorge, if you can direct it direct, 
directed directly to Rebecca. Uh, and if we have time, we'll stay here at the break. I doubt this will happen today, but if we have time, we'll stay here during the break for additional questions. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Marco, I'll uh, give you a warning 10 minutes in. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so first of all, I, I want to really thank the organizer to organize this very nice workshop and to give me the opportunity to present uh, my uh, recent work on this topic. And particularly, I'm going to uh, talk about a potential indirect probe of the QCD action as dark matter and also the further development we made to predict the radar signal of uh, action dark matter converted in a neutral star. So I don't think I have to, oh, sorry. Okay. I don't think I have to really uh, introduce the axion. I just want to mention that the axion is originally introduced to solve the QCD, the strong CP problem in the QCD sector, but it also turned out to be a very uh, well-motivated and viable uh, dark matter candidate. And also, I mean, in general, axion-like particle are predicted by many uh, beyond standard model theories. And uh, also I would like to mention that the, um, it, it, the axion, in particular the QCD axion, is expected to efficiently couple to the photons through the, uh, this uh, axion to the photon coupling. And also uh, due to this coupling, it's expected to, to be converted into photons when it uh, travels along a, an external magnetic field. So in this plot here, I just uh, summarize the current uh, uh, searches and constraints uh, of the axion and axional particle in the plane of the coupling and the mass. So all these uh, uh, gray, uh, blue, and green line, uh, green region are excluded. So there is still a lot of uh, open uh, parameter space for the pussy axion here and also for uh, axion-like particle in Y. So the astrophysical system that uh, I would like to investigate today is <coughs> a binary uh, system of an intermediate mass black hole and a neutral star. Uh, um, and in particular, in, um, what happens if around the black hole, there is the presence of a, an axionic uh, matter spike. So this spike has two unique effects. In particular, it has a, a peculiar effect into the gravitational waves that are produced by the binary system of neutral star in the middle of the core. In particular, there is a phase shift in the gravitational wave uh, waveform. And also, um, due to the coupling of the axion to the magnetic fields, and particular to the magnetic field of the neutral star, there is also an electromagnetic emission in radio waves. And so uh, this can be probed with the radio telescope. So before to uh, Describing in detail this system, uh, let me clarify that here we are interested in the uh, year-long uh, inspiring phase of this binary system, so not just the merger, and this is out of reach of the current uh, interferometer like uh, LIGO and Virgo. And also uh, we are interested in uh, intermediate mass black core that, and in, from which uh, the, they produce basically a subhertz gravitational wave is still, I mean, light and are not sensitive to this wave. So these uh, observations are really for future uh, interferometer like LISA, uh, the space-based interferometer, and also for future radio telescope like uh, the square kilometer array. So what about the, uh, the dark matter spike? So intermediate mass black core may exist and form in the matter halo. And this basically trigger a adiabatic growth of the dark matter halo and forming later uh, a dark matter spike. So starting from uh, a specific profile like the, Navarro the standard navarro Frankie white uh, profile here in blue, uh, during the evolution, there is the adiabatic growth. And then uh, the, uh, now the, the, the the profile of the matter becomes a spike, which is completely defined by the slope. And for the number of Frankie White, one expects from analytical calculation a slope of the spike of three over uh, seven over three. And so you see that basically uh, at the, at the uh, around the black hole here, the, the radius is at the distance from the center of black hole. The dark matter density is uh, enlarged by. So, Sushi, you're going to have 25 minutes uh, maybe, uh, total, including questions. Uh, I'm going to. This give has a uh, peculiar effect, after especially when minutes. talking okay. about gravitational wave. 
So when we okay, want to describe the, uh, the the inspiring phase of the neutral so star merging to yes. the black hole, in particular to okay. describe okay. the so gravitational wave emission, uh, this is, uh, I mean, is we need to use uh, this equation, the uh, energy loss equation to... that really describe the, the loss of energy of the orbit. And so in vacuum, without the, uh, the presence body, of the dark matter spike, the question, of course, the system uh, just lose energy through the emission of the gravitational yeah. wave. But instead, if there is the, the presence of so the dark matter spike, we have also additional speaker, force, the Sergio. drug force known as dynamical friction. And this basically well, causes uh, an additional energy so loss we move on. in the system. So the, the thing is that uh, compared to the vacuum, the system loses uh, more rapidly energy, and so the time to merge is reduced. And I would also su suggest to uh, our attend next speaker, the, the, the talk by Bradley in the next section that I think is going to um, discuss in detail his effect. But make the uh, so long story short, time, uh, uh, this additional in, uh, energy loss causes a phase shift in the gravitational wave scene. So I would suggest if you have uh, anything no, else to ask to Sergio, uh, please contact me directly. So in this plot, I'm going to so show the phase difference, the, the cumulative stop. phase difference, we move on as a function of the frequency of the gravitational wave which, uh, for three different slopes. Remind that the orange line here is our benchmark scenario coming from the Navarro and White. And so you can see that. Hello, can you? For uh, low frequency, we have a Jack, huge uh, phase okay. difference here, and this is due mainly to the fact so that the Atlas, this uh, uh, low exactly frequency, the, the, the system, the binary system uh, in the neutral star uh, makes uh, the majority of, uh, uh, takes Jack, a lot of there? cycle uh, and spend a lot of time at uh, low frequency, while the, uh, the, the, phase, the phase difference here is uh, is very low when the frequency oh, is large hello, because okay? of course the system is really approaching the emergent time and so spends a few times uh, in so for the, example the signal orbit. reading five has and so a measuring the this phase region, difference the signal uh, itself is actually is, quite low uh, allowed one potentially to measure and constrain the dark matter density around the okay. I, I, I hear this you is a very a important bit. thing because uh, one wondering that the presence of yeah, the matter of lots, spike lots, around the black hole uh, is not uh, um, uh, things can influence the branching. I mean, this yes. could be Lots speculative, but in this way, we yeah, could in principle measure the dark density and so constrain okay. the dark matter density. Okay, okay, very good. So, in this plot, I showed so the sensitivity of the future uh, listen interferometer time. So uh, to Jack, a system of this kind, and thank you again the, very much. The potential for the constraint and measurement of the dark matter density as function of the radial distance between the black hole, the intermediate mass black hole, and the neutral star. In particular, you see that we compare this constraint with respect to our fiducial density of the dark matter spy with the slope of a seven third. So you see that when the, um, the, the session. Uh, neto star and the intermediate mass core are quite far apart, we are able to provide a very tight constraint on the matter profile, even with the accuracy of uh, uh, less than a uh, few percent, while the constraint becomes very worse when the neutral star is approaching the uh, uh, black hole. And this is due to basically three effects. So just to mention, in this range, when the radius, the separation between two objects is very small, the gravitational wave emission dominates of the dynamic of friction. As you can see in the upper uh, axis, also in this region, the system spend uh, less time. So uh, this also reduced the uh, detectability of the dark matter density around the black hole. And also in this range, the frequency of a uh, uh, Gravitational wave signal is uh, close to the Hertz frequency where the LISA sensitivity is uh, uh, not so good. So this uh, is basically the, the measurement of the matter density that can be used to uh, um, uh, provide and predict the radio signal from the neutral star. So just to quickly mention, the neutral star will be recognized as a uh, uh, good, good target to look for axion, in particular because they, are, they have uh, high magnetic fields and also they are surrounded by uh, charged particles, a plasma, that gives uh, the photons an effective mass. And so they can trigger a resonant conversion of the axion, the Foley axion, uh, through the magnetic field of the neutral star into radio photons. So for the sake of the next slides, I'm going to use the uh, approximation that the 
the trajectory of the Foley uh, axion are radial. And so in this case, we have a analytical prediction for the radiated power of uh, the, uh, the, the neutral star into radio photons. So- Mark, you are half the way. Yes. We're 10 minutes uh, in. Plus okay, minutes. thanks. So, uh, so here I'm showing the, uh, the SKA sensitivity of uh, the radio signal recast in the axion photon coupling as function of the axion mass. So here we show two different systems with two different distances from us. One which is very uh, optimistic because I mean, we expect uh, uh, basically only uh, very small events uh, um, of one year observation with LISA and one I mean, of, um, realistic case where we have a system of one gigaparsec away from us. And you can see here two different uh, snapshots of the binary uh, black corner star system with two different separation of the two objects. So everything above this red line can be probed uh, potentially and observed by SKA. So I just want to mention that we have two uh, cutoff, in particular the lower cutoff is due to the lowest frequency that can be observed with SKA, while the uh, upper cutoff here uh, comes from the fact that we need to require that the conversion of action happen outside the neutral star. And here we assume a, a neutral star over a radius of 10 kilometers. So the take home message of this work is that we can basically uh, probe the dynamic density around an intermediate mass black core with the gravitational wave. And this can be used to predict and observe the, the radio signal produced by the action conversion into uh, photons in the neutral star magnetosphere. So uh, this system, of course, is not able to um, provide robust limit because there are a lot of uncertainties in the neutral star uh, parameters, but we think that is, uh, could basically be a smoking gun and potentially discover of uh, action that matter with uh, multi-messenger uh, observation. So with the gravitational wave and uh, radio photons. So in the next few minutes, I will discuss the further development that we made to predict and investigate the radio signal producing the uh, neutral star environment. So here I just uh, briefly mentioned, I mean, this is the system, the neutral star here, this is the earth. And then we would like to see all the radio photons producing the neutral star magnetosphere and reach the earth. So there is an important point that I made in the previous slide that Basically, I was assumed that the phase space distribution of infolding action uh, is uh, radial, but actually this is not the case, it is isotropic. So this is why uh, basically we uh, developed a ray tracing code to uh, take into account this uh, isotropic phase space distribution. And so the idea is that we define a region of interest with some pixel here. For each pixel, we define the radio photons. We big propagate these radio photons, and then we collect uh, all the photons, and particularly we compute all the uh, uh, radiated power for each pixel. So the, the, the message here is that there is no a preference direction uh, related to the Foley axion, but basically all the possible trajectory, which are isotropic, contribute to this signal. So we developed a ray tracing code, and this is a, a movie of the simulation for uh, this uh, neutral star here, which is an isolated neutral star uh, placed at uh, roughly 200 uh, parsec from us. So this is the radiated power in the region of interest, and this is the radiated power for each pixel in the, in the simulation. So there are uh, important effects due to the, uh, the reason, to the fact that the phase space distribution is not uh, radial, but instead is isotropic. So in this plot, you see the radiated power for three different action masses. In blue, you see our prediction from the isotropic phase space distribution. And in black, you see the analytic prediction assuming a radial uh, uh, phase space distribution. And the three different curves here refer to the three different directions. So first of all, you see that the overall normalization of the signal, uh, in particular, the one from isotropic distribution is more or less two, a factor of two or 10 in order magnitude an order of magnitude smaller with respect to the radial case. Moreover, uh, you see that there is no really a strong uh, time dependence of the signal. Here you see this, the radiated power as function of the instantaneous phase over a period of, of a different period of the star. So you see that in the radial case, you have some peak uh, um, because basically there is a preferred direction that you can um, 
the, the axion uh, conversion is enhanced, while taking into account the isotropy of the phase space distribution, then this erase basically and washed out the time variability. But most importantly, you see that for very large axion masses, you don't see any black line because the radial uh, uh, phase space distribution basically say that there is no uh, production of radio photons, while in the case of isotropy, given the fact that there are many more trajectories to be taken into account, then we are able to probe even uh, larger axion masses. So to conclude, here is the, my last slide. So here you can see again the sensitivity of SKA, of the future uh, radio telescope SKA for this isolated neutral star, again, in the plane of the axion photon coupling as function of axion masses. So here, this is the result from our uh, simulation with the retracing code. So you see that here we have two prediction and for the sensitivity assuming two different broadening of the line. So here we just take into account the broadening of the uh, um, photon line, uh, take into account the uh, velocity distribution of the um, particle. Here, instead with the dashed line, we take into account the Doppler broadening uh, produced by the uh, motion of the magnetosphere. And here in this uh, red line, or red band, you see the, the sensitivity, the phi sigma sensitivity to discover and detect the time, the time variability of the signal. So the main result of this work are that in general, the sensitivity is reduced by a factor of three, but we are able to extend and probe axion signal with the larger axion masses here. And in general, as you can see here, the detection of the time dependence of the signal is, uh, uh, is quite difficult. But we basically did a crucial step forward in uh, calculating and predicting the uh, radio signal from this system. We are still making progress uh, and improvement of, the, of these codes, but the ray tracing code is, uh, is public and can be in general generalized, take into account different neutral star system or the different neutral star magnetosphere, or also to take into account potentially the 3D, uh, I mean, the, the mixing equation in the 3D space. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Marco. And also, thank you very much for being on time. Um, is there any question from Marco? I think we have at least time for at least one question and an answer, hopefully. Question and one, question and two. I have a question, but I don't think it's of general interest. And at this point, I think it's more of general interest to keep the timing, Marco. So I will, uh, I will ask you privately or maybe during the break. Um, okay, thanks. Thank you very much again. And can, the, can you unshare your presentation? And we hope on to the next speaker. I think it's Manuela. We're speaking, I believe, Manuela, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Manuela, we speaking on behalf of the Illness Collaboration, if I understand correctly. And Manuela is also one of the, our former organizers of this workshop, one of the original one, the core group that got it started. Very well, Manuela, you are on. I will give you, an, good, this was Marcos Tani. I will give you a warning when you are 10 minutes in, and then it's up to you to deal with your time. Go ahead, stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And so it is my pleasure to show you this afternoon, the, I mean, today, <laughs> the latest results from the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer in space on behalf of the AMS collaboration. Before I go ahead with the AMS results, I would like to give a short introduction on the topic of indirect WIMP searches. If we assume that dark matter is made of weakly interacting massive particles, these particles can uh, self-annihilate and uh, produce um, in the final states um, both neutral and charged messengers that we can detect uh, with ground-based or space-based detectors. For example, we can detect gamma rays or neutrinos, which are neutral, and so they, uh, we can point back to their uh, sources. Um, on the other side, uh, we could uh, hope to uh, detect uh, um, 
cosmic rays charged messengers, and in particular the antimatter component of cosmic rays, uh, namely positrons, antiprotons, and hopefully antinuclei. However, because these particles are charged, we cannot use them to point back to their sources. So um, basically, um, a dark matter signal in uh, cosmic rays would appear as a distortion in the flux with respect to the astrophysical background. Dark matter searches with cosmic rays can be performed by comparing the measured antimatter flux from antiprotons or positrons. And this is what I will show you today from AMS. This data can be compared to uh, the model that includes information on the particle physics, annihilation channels, for example, the information on the dark matter density, and information on cosmic ray transport propagation effects in the uh, galaxy and the diffusive halo. Now, uh, let me uh, discuss the AMS detector. AMS is in space, taking data since 2011, and it is a particle physics detector operating in space. It is made of several sub detectors. So from the top to the bottom, we have a transition radiation detector that we use to perform uh, lepton hadron separation. So this is particularly important for the positron measurements because we want to reject the uh, abundant proton flux. Then we have uh, the silicon tracker, nine layers of silicon tracker uh, that uh, together with the permanent uh, magnet uh, are used for the measurement of the particle momentum, charge ma magnitude, and charge sign. I remind you that AMS is currently the only operating experiment in space uh, with a magnetic field, and this allows for a unique access to the cosmic ray antimatter. Then we have four layers of the time of flight, two layers above the magnet and two layers below the magnet for the measurement of the uh, particle velocity and charge magnitude. We also have a ring imaging Cherekov detector for independent measurement of the charge velocity and uh, for the uh, velocity and charge and the charge. Last but not least, we have a compact electromagnetic calorimeter at the very bottom of our detector. And uh, it is used uh, for two purposes. First of all, an independent uh, method for lepton hadron separation based on the shape of the shower. And then we use the ECAL for the measurement of the electron and positron um, energy. This detector is quite compact and weighs about 7.5 tons. As I said, AMS is on the International Space Station since uh, nine years, and so far we have collected over 160 billion particles in the GV to TV energy range. Before I go ahead with the results, um, I would like to uh, remind you that uh, AMS is tailored to measure particles in uh, the GV to TV energy range, that corresponds to the region in which particles are mainly of galactic origin. And in this energy range, the, because we make the measurements of the particle before the particle interacts with the atmosphere, we have access to the composition of cosmic rays. And in particular, galactic cosmic rays are uh, dominated by protons. About 90% of galactic cosmic rays are protons. Then we have about 8% of helium nuclei and a few com a small component of heavier nuclei, um, lithium, beryllium, carbon, up to iron, about 1% of electrons and a tiny component of antimatter, which is about 10 to the uh, 10,000 uh, times less abundant than protons. And in particular, we have poros positrons and antiprotons. In the search for primary antimatter, we have uh, the main background, especially positrons, the main background comes from protons. And this background is reduced by combining complementary detection techniques, namely the transition radiation detector, the tracker, and the ECAL. This slide shows the flux of positrons in uh, cyan and, uh, sorry, positrons in yellow and electrons in cyan. Uh, as a function of energy before AMS. 
So you can uh, see that the measurements uh, were affected by large uncertainties and could cover a limited energy range. This is our latest uh, measurement of electrons and positrons. In particular, this is the uh, electron and the positron flux rescaled to the energy to the cube as a function of energy between um, 0 0.5 and uh, about 1 TeV. Actually, the, positive, the electrons go up to 1.4 TeV. So you can see that uh, in the entire energy range, the electron and positron fluxes are distinct in magnitude and energy dependence. We will see in a minute why. Moreover, the, uh, then let's see now the, uh, the, the flux of positrons in, in detail. Here, I show you the flux of positrons rescaled as a function of energy. And this measurement is based on 1.9 million positrons, and it goes up to 1 TeV for the first time. So the, uh, the yellow points indicate the AMS measurement, uh, superimposed with the predictions for a model based on positrons from cosmic ray collision. And you can see that while low energy positrons mostly come from cosmic ray collisions, meaning proton, uh, cosmic ray proton interacting with the interstellar medium, which is itself mainly made of protons, we have a big discrepancy uh, between the data and the model. So this uh, indicates the need for a source of positrons which must be local, because I remind you that positrons and electrons have very short uh, detection horizon, uh, limited to at most a few kiloparsec due to their um, severe energy losses. So um, we have analyzed, we have compared our uh, positron flux measurement with a simple model, which is the sum of a low energy part from cosmic ray collision, a power law, and a high energy power law with an exponential cutoff. So you see, um, the, the, positron has a, the positron flux has a very complex shape. It is rising uh, up to about 10 uh, giga electron volts because in the region where it is dominated by the, magnetic, the, the solar modulation. Then we have a flat behavior when uh, above um, 25 giga electron volt, a rise behavior and then a falling uh, behavior. So basically, uh, comparing this, uh, our measurement to this simple model, we have been able to uh, point out that um, this um, energy cutoff of the source term uh, is, uh, of a uh, has a value of 810 giga electron volt at four sigma. And in the entire energy range, our uh, positron flux can be described by this sum of two contributions. The important thing, uh, one more important thing is that in this model, we have a source term whose nature is not clear. We can only say that we have a significant evidence of the fact that we have a cutoff at 810 gigavolt, but we cannot um, discriminate between the nature of the source. So we know that this source could be astrophysical like pulsars or exotic like the annihilation of dark matter. So this is a cartoon that elucidates this uh, concept. And uh, as an illustration, uh, I would like to point out that it is possible to interpret uh, the MS positron spectrum in terms of uh, classes, uh, dark matter model. And this is um, just an example of a WIMP-like uh, dark matter model uh, for a, um, a dark matter mass of 1.2 uh, TeV that is reproducing very well our data. Manuela, you are uh, half to just past half the way. So you still okay. have 9 minutes and 30 seconds in total. Thank you. However, um, as I said, the, the, there are two classes of sources which can uh, reproduce, uh, describe our data. And the second class, for example, astrophysical sources. And in particular, pulsars are known to uh, produce uh, and accelerate positrons up to high energies mostly uh, in uh, per production. At the same time, pulsars are unlikely to produce heavier antimatter particles or heavier particles, so they are unlikely to produce antiprotons. So it is important uh, to establish the origin of the uh, positron flux and the excess with respect, uh, with respect to the astrophysical background to study additional um, observable, additional measurements of cosmic rays. Here we have 
the measurement of uh, antiproton flux compared to the positron flux. So um, in yellow, again, the positrons, and in uh, blue, the antiprotons um, as a function of energy. We can see that surprisingly, antiprotons show a similar trend with respect to proton, positrons. And in particular, at uh, high energy above about 60 giga electron volt, the positron to antiproton flux ratio is constant, independent of energy. And uh, um, essentially, the positron flux is twice as high high as the antiproton flux. There is a large class of uh, dark matter models that require an excess of antiprotons. And uh, here you see um, several uh, interpretation papers not related to the collaboration, which have pointed out uh, um, an excess of antiprotons about uh, around uh, um, 10 uh, giga electron volts. And this excess could be related to um, the uh, annihilation of dark matter particles with mass of about 100 giga electron volts, even though uh, there are some con concerns at the level of the production cross sections and uh, on the solar modulation uncertainties. Now, let me uh, show you about the origin of cosmic ray electrons. Here, you see the electron flux, uh, rescaled to the rescaled electron flux as a function of energy. And this measurement, as shown in blue, is based on 28 million electrons up to 1.4 TeV. Uh, you also see that uh, we have the superimposed the prediction for uh, electrons from cosmic ray collisions from the Galprop simulation. This tells you that, uh, as it is uh, known, the contribution uh, from cosmic ray collisions to the electron flux is negligible uh, because electrons are thought to be primary species uh, accelerated in the, um, probably in supernova remnants. Um, however, um, we can also see that the electron flux uh, cannot uh, be, um, uh, sorry, can be described over the whole energy range by two power law functions, A and B. So basically, we need just the four parameters, two uh, uh, constant and two uh, spectral indices, to, uh, uh, to, describe, uh, to describe accurately the spectrum uh, in the GV to TV energy range. We, are over, we have uh, also uh, tested that at five sigma, the electron flux does not have a sharp uh, energy cutoff below the TV. And uh, um, yes, so this is about the electron flux. And now in the last part of my talk, I would like to describe, to show you the latest result about cosmic ray nuclei, which are not immediately related to dark matter searches, However, precise measurement of this species is really important in order to better describe and characterize the uh, astrophysical background in the search for dark matter with cosmic rays. So uh, traditionally, there are two prominent classes of cosmic rays, primaries like hydrogen, carbon, iron, produced and accelerated in um, the cosmic ray sources like supernova remnants. And then we have uh, another class, which is the uh, secondary cosmic rays, like lithium or boron, which are produced by the collision of primary cosmic rays with the interstellar medium. Cosmic ray propagation being commonly modeled as a diffusion process uh, due to the, tur the turbulent uh, magnetic fields, uh, these processes shape the fluxes. So precise measurements of primary and secondary species allow key information on propagation and source processes. Here, I show you the, uh, uh, the charge distributions, uh, the, the species that we can detect with AMS. Uh, and we have the charge measured by the scintillators of the time of flight as a function of the, the charge measured with the tracker. And you see the distinction between primary species in cyan and secondary species in yellow. Um, we have uh, recently published uh, precise measurement of cosmic ray nuclei. And in particular, we have published the fluxes of helium, carbon, and oxygen as a function of rigidity, which is the momentum over charge, in a wide energy range up to the TV. 
Here, this plot is quite complex and crowded, but essentially shows the flux, rescaled flux as a function of rigidity for two species, for these two classes of sources. Helium, carbon, and oxygen, despite having a different composition, helium being largely more abundant, they show the same exact rigidity dependence. And uh, they cannot be described, the fluxes cannot be described as a single power law, and they harden in the identical way above about 200 gigavolts. Last, uh, in the last uh, months, we also published the fluxes of neon, magnesium, and silicon. And these are uh, the species which are about in reddish, brownish here. And uh, um, these latest results point out that uh, these species have the same uh, composition, the same rigidity behavior, but different with respect to hydro, uh, to helium, carbon, and oxygen. So we have been able to point out that primary cosmic rays have at least two classes uh, with respect to their um, rigidity, momentum over charge dependence. And this is extremely important to understand the processes they undergo via uh, in the sources or in the propagation. Manuela, sorry to interrupt you, but you're really close to your total time. You have uh, less than three minutes to your total time, including question. Like you're well inside your question time right now. Yes. So uh, then I think I can uh, show you quickly how the secondary species behave. They are uh, in re uh, identical rigidity dependence, the lithium, beryllium, and boron here in orange, but they are different from primaries. Uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, present you our latest result on the flux of iron, which is measured for, uh, by AMS with high precision up to the TEV. And this result is in, uh, currently in, um, submitted to uh, PRL. And uh, the iron is belonging to the class of, uh, um, is behaving, the, the iron rigidity dependence is the same as uh, helium, carbon, and oxygen uh, being also another uh, primary species. So uh, I think that I am done. And uh, um, thank you for your attention. I would like to uh, stress again that AMS results are really uh, challenging the current cosmic ray models and require the development of a comprehensive theoretical scheme. AMS is taking data since nine years and will continue that taking until the end of the, life, the lifetime of the space station. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Manuela, for the nice talk and for being basically perfectly on time. We have a total of literally uh, less than 60 seconds for a question and an answer. So I know that there is a question for you. Ivone, if you think you can ask it and then Manuela can answer within 50 seconds. Yes, so yeah. I'll just start. So Manuela, you show um, that the positron data fits to a dark matter model. Uh, is that a class of models? Like what's the mass of the dark matter to fit um, this, this data? Like are oh, they uh, weird? Short, a very short answer. This is an illustration to give you an idea of the fact that it is possible to fit oh, okay. uh, the data with the dark matter model and uh, the mass of this part, dark matter particle is 1.2 TV. Okay, and it's kind of a WAMP, weekly interacting, yes. blah, blah, yes. blah. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you very much, Manuela Devoni. We're perfectly on time, Manuela, if you can unshare your screen. Sure. Uh, and uh, I should call Pedro de la Torre Luque to connect, uh, if you can, Pedro. Yes, hello. Very uh, well, I can see your camera, I cannot see your presentation. Uh, I can still see your face, you see something is happening. Very well. Okay, Pedro, uh, I will please start. I will uh, interrupt you to say you have a total of 13. In total, you have 15 minutes. It's up to you whether you want to use 12 plus three or you just want to talk. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm Pedro de la Torre working at the University of Paris. And today I'm going to talk about the uncertainties related to the production of antiprotons uh, from cosmic ray interactions. And it's important that this has for indirect searches on dark matter. So after a brief introduction, we will go through two main points. First, the evaluation of the propagation of cosmic rays 
and the generation of secondary particles, namely secondary cosmic rays like boron and antiprotons. Second, we will go through the evaluation of the antiproton spectrum and we will look for any possible hint of dark matter producing antiprotons. So that the main goals of the talk will be to show the full uncertainties associated to the cosmic ray production of antiprotons and to see if there is any hint of extra sources of antiprotons like dark matter annihilation or decay. So the basic idea behind the, the uh, propagation of cosmic rays is that while primary cosmic rays mainly generated in, in supernova remanents propagate through the galaxy, they randomly interact with magnetic plasma waves, causing them to have sort of a random motion that we study in terms of a diffusive movement. So while they are diffusing, they can occasionally interact with the gas in the interstellar medium, producing secondary particles. These secondary particles are mainly secondary cosmic rays, but they can also be uh, neutrinos, gamma rays, or even antiprotons, for example. And as you can see from the basic equations that I have wrote, wrote, wrote written in the right, there is a very straightforward relation between the diffusion coefficient that we use to explain this movement and the ratio of the flux of secondary cosmic rays to primary cosmic rays. And here, sigma stands for the cross-sections of production of the secondary cosmic ray. And well, in, in particular, this is the relation that is the commonly used to determine the diffusion coefficient from the experimental data of secondary to primary ratios. And in fact, this is also what I'm gonna use here in this talk. So in order to do so, I have implemented a Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis uh, in which we are able to solve the, pro the full propagation equation with the dragon code and using the dragon two cross sections for the for the cross section, uh, the dragon two cross sections for the production of secondary cosmic rays and the Winkler cross sections for the production of antiprotons. So that with this implementation, we are able to, to use whatever parameterization of the diffusion coefficient. And here I'm showing you two of the most common used that I label as the source hypothesis and the diffusion hypothesis. As you can see, uh, from the uh, secondary to primary flux ratios of lithium, beryllium, and boron over carbon and oxygen that I'm showing in the right, uh, they, they allow us to reproduce very well the data. Although uh, the diffusion hypothesis is slightly favored from the for the data. And the good point here is that we expect that this, the, the systematic uncertainties uh, for these parameterizations in the energy region between one and 200 giga electron volts is not very important, it's uh, quite small. However, we have to take into account, obviously, the statistical uncertainties in the determination of the, the parameters in the parameterizations. And this, for sure, depends on the experimental data we are using. In this case, we are using the most accurate data, the, those from the AMSO2 collaboration. And the problem here is that they did not report publicly the error correlations that we expect to be here. And to evaluate how the effect of including or not including this correlation of errors, we have determined the diffusion coefficient and the uncertainties related uh, using an estimation of this correlation of errors and using just the public version of the AMSO2 data. And as you can see, uh, when using the correlation of errors, the uncertainties are always larger and this become more important in the very high and very low energy region. On the other hand, using the diffusion coefficient derived from the boron over carbon spectrum, we have also derived the antiproton over proton spectrum for our model. And, then you, and I would like to say that I'm using the antiproton over proton spectrum because it is less subject to other uncertainties related to the antiproton determination. But as you can see, uh, our model underestimates the amount of antiprotons. And in fact, there is a prominent signal around 10 GB that, as Manuela said, has been reported by many other authors before and has been related to the uh, creation of antiprotons from dark matter, particularly from a WIMP particle of around 60 to 80 GB, as you can see from the lower left plot. And the point here is that we are missing something very important. 
and we are missing the uncertainties in the in related to the cross sections of bottom production that as you can see are not negligible at all in fact it has been estimated that the uncertainties in the normalization of these parameterizations are of the order of 20g uh, of 20 percent and these uncertainties for sure translate into the uncertainties in the prediction of the bottom flux and therefore in the bottom over carbon flux. So in order to prevent from these uncertainties, we have used a combined analysis where we include the secondary to primary ratios of bottom and beryllium to carbon and oxygen, as well as, as, well as the antiproton over proton spectrum. In addition here, we included also scaling factors for the normalization of the cross-sections parameterizations of boron and beryllium. As you can see, uh, the agreement of our model with respect to the experimental data in all the ratios is very good. And in fact, this, this determination has also improved our, our evaluation of the anti-proton spectrum. And, and here, I would like to remark two main things. First, the, the uncertainties related to the diffusion, to, to the determination of the diffusion coefficient ha, has, uh, are almost negligible around 10 GB. And on the other hand, now the residuals, although we have also a prominent as excess of data uh, over our model around 10 GB, this signal now has residuals of around 10%. And for sure here, we have also to take into account another source of, uh, of uncertainty, which are the uncertainties in the, pro in the cross sections of production of antiprotons. And this is not trivial at all because we have to take into account in addition to the antiproton production from the cosmic ray interactions, the decay of antineutrons on antiprotons and, and for sure the the is a spring asymmetry factor between antineutrons and antiprotons. And on the other hand, we have to take into account also the decay of antihyperons into antiprotons. So to show the effects of the of different parameterizations uh, on the cross sections of antiproton production, I'm showing here the predictions from our combined model using two different parameterizations. And as you can see, the different parameterizations have an important repercussion on the energy region around 10 GB. Although I have to say that the Winkler cross-sections that we are using are one of the most uh, recent and accurate cross-sections derived, but, uh, but I have to say that from the data, there are estimations of the total uncertainties in the parameterizations of the cross-sections, of these cross-sections. And these estimations uh, uh, locate the, the uncertainties to be around 12 to 20% not an agreeable um, amount of uncertainties. Eh? Pedro, so, sorry to interrupt you. You have, you have uh, six minutes and something left in total. So Perfect, I perfect. I am well on time. And I have to add to, to all these uncertainties also other systematic uncertainties that we can somehow evaluate. For example, the solar modulation uncertainties that become very important at low energies, as you can see from the right plot, or the uh, systematic uncertainties on the scaling factors that are estimated to be around 5%, as you can see from the, from the left plot. So the final evaluation of the total uncertainties is shown in this slide for the uh, using on top of using the one sigma uncertainties and on top of these one sigma uncertainties, the systematic uncertainties that I have mentioned in the last slide. And in the left side plot, I'm showing the residuals with respect to AMSO2 data, and in the side right plot, the residuals with respect to our reference model. And the conclusions are clear, and it, it is that the, the feature around 10 GB is not significant at all, even under conservative assumptions, because in this evaluation of the total uncertainties, we didn't include any, any, pos any correlation in the AMSO2 data, not, not even in the in the possible uncertainties in the uh, inserting heavy elements on the determination on the, of the antiproton flux, which are around two percent. So I have gone fast, but I have reached my conclusions. We have shown that there is a prominent a prominent 
excess of data over our models peaking around 10 GB, and this has been related to the production of antiprotons from dark matter. But we have been able to see to, to lower the, the residuals around this energy region by, by making a more careful analysis of the quantities that play important roles in the propagation modeling. Uh, on the other hand, we have also shown that the most important source of uncertainties are those of, from the cross-sections of antiproton production that are in fact around 15%, while the rest of uncertainties can sum to be around 7%. And finally, we have shown that the, total, the, that the uncertainties uh, in this determination make this excess of data completely not significant at all even having to account only conservative assumptions and not the full, I mean, this is not uh, an upper limit of the uncertainties. And in fact, we have eva eva evaluated the uncertainties within very conservative assumptions. So that's all. So thank you very much. And please give me your questions. Thank you very much, Pedro, for being perfectly within the time. Is there Anybody that has questions for Pedro? So I would like to understand that the fact that the excess of the data over the model is not significant at all, it means that we don't have to worry. We don't have to invoke anything strange. Well, uh, for sure here, we need more data mainly on experimental data on the cross sections of antiproton production. But even though it's not easy because of the of the fact that we have to take into account various uh, different, let's say, processes at the same time. But uh, it is true that there is a prominent signal that is very clear and remind us a, a bump, no? That can be perfectly solved, including yeah, that matter. I understand. So the, the problem is in the cross sections. The problem is in the uncertainties. Is not. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pedro. Then unless there is any other question, we have something like less than a minute. One more question and one and two and three. Thank you very much, Pedro, again. And uh, Peter, can you, Pedro, can you unshare your screen? Um, yes. Hello. I'm gonna share the screen. Very good. Can you see it? We can see it, now it's full screen. So I will adopt the same uh, philosophy. I will give you a warning when you are eight-ish minutes in and you have a total of 10 minutes. So, uh, you know, you can deal with it as you please, right? All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here. Um, right now I'm in Heidelberg, but in, a, in about a month I'm going to start my postdoc in Sao Paulo. So it's a great opportunity to say hello to Sao Paulo people already. And it's also a, a good opportunity to say hello to the indirect detection community because this is the first time I'm in an indirect detection session. Because if you work with Tillman Plain, um, who's doing collider physics, and Peter Richardson, who's the main author of the Hervic uh, LHC tool, uh, it's more likely that you end up in a, in a LHC tool session or in a collider session. So I'm going to tell you like how I ended up here in the indirect detection uh, session now. Uh, we, we started the project with looking at the mass range just for standard dark matter searches. So the LHC operates at several TV, so it's covering TV uh, scale um, particles, GV scale particles down to a few GV probably. Um, and direct detection is making use directly of the dark, uh, local dark matter density. So it's sensitive to the dark matter mass and can go down to a GV and depending on the recoil energy, then or the sensitivity to the recall energy even lower probably. And then there's indirect detection, which is sensitive to the number density squared since we have two incoming dark matter particles annihilating then to standard model particles. So it's also really sensitive to the dark matter mass and we can really go below the GeV uh, range into the sub-GeV region. 
So what we initially thought about is looking at that range, the sub GV range, and check like how indirect detection uh, constrains it, maybe direct detection, and then like maybe find some LHC searches that could also explore that region. But we soon found out that indirect detection is actually putting really, really strong constraints on, in, in the sub GV region already in the in the GV region actually. So so we have constraints that like constraints from CMB and also Fermi and AMS and all, like all indirect detection searches that exclude already uh, dark matter annihilations, for example, at like 10 GV or even higher, like about like 100 GV already. So this is already pretty bad news to explore the sub GV region as it's excluded. But this is only the case for the standard WIM scenario. So where we have like a hundred percent S wave annihilation of one dark matter candidate to an individual channel. So we have a dark matter annihilation, for example, to electrons, to taus, or to bees or quarks. And they fully annihilate into that channel and also describe the relic density. So the total amount of dark matter in the universe. So that would be the overabundance below the dashed line and above the, the colored lines, the, uh, it's the region that is excluded by um, indirect detection. So we have a really small window, like a, only a window for, window for higher uh, GV masses. But that's really for the standard WIMP. So in the sub GV region, we only we not have like only the standard WIMP, but we have like several hidden dark matter sectors. So new degrees of freedom um, that have an impact then on indirect detection. So they can change indirect detection constraints, for example, in dark photons, B minus L models, or if there's an asymmetry in the dark sector, for example. And that effect is, for example, that we have a sizable fraction of dark matter annihilating to invisible particles. So like the particles we produce don't have any impact on the CMB or indirect uh, detection um, experiments. Or we have a resonant sub GV Dirac dark matter um, that is resonantly annihilating a dark matter in, at some time in the universe, but at some other time, maybe not resonantly anymore. Or we have dark matter annihilation that is only describing a fraction of all dark matter, or even more drastically, like the dark matter production mechanism and the dark matter annihilation process are completely separated. Or we have an asymmetric dark matter. So if it's fully asymmetric, the dark matter particle doesn't find a partner to annihilate with anymore. But if it's only slightly asymmetric, there can be some, still be some indirect detection signal, but it's weakened, uh, it's weaker than like by the standard WIM searches. And as another, another example is, for example, if we have some dark matter bound states that emit dark photons that are in the sub GV region that also give some indirect detection signals. And probably there are many more models uh, in the sub GV region in the hidden dark matter sector that could describe that region well and describe dark matter really, really well. And besides we have experiments also in that uh, energy region for GV scale telescope, we have Familet and uh, AMS in the sub GV region we can and make use of integral data, as we've seen in Elena uh, Pinetti's talk two days ago. And there are also future MEV astronomy programs like Astrogram or Amigo, and probably many, many other things, uh, experiments that um, could explore that region here. So basically the stage is set. I mean, we have a lot of models that are in the sub GV region that are not excluded by indirect detection. And we have a lot of experiments plus CMB constraints. So we could like just start to explore the, the hidden sectors in the sub GV range, right? So the way we would do it is like to calculate those constraints, for example, by CMB. And here we have like some particle physics input for, uh, and among that, like the effective, um, like the fraction of energy that is coming from an annihilation and is injected into the CMB. And as you can see here on the right hand side, the, the, the effect that the fraction, the factor is, has been calculated for a really large range of uh, dark matter masses. But it's somehow cut off here at one GV, but we are interested in the sub GV region. And you can also see that 
it's going from solid lines to dashed lines, and the dashed lines in indicate that we cannot we cannot really trust these uh, results anymore. And this is because of we don't really have energy spectra for that region for the region below a few GeV. But we also need those energy spectra, for example, for standard indirect detection searches here. So why do we have, like, why do we not have any energy spectra for that region? Because they're um, all based on, on uh, um, Monte Carlo tools that were designed for the LHC for, so for high energy regions. We have like a, where we have a calcul the calculation of a hard process followed by a parton shower, then hydronization, and then these hadrons decay to mesons and other particles. And in the end, we have stable particles that are then have an impact on indirect detection experiments and the CMB, for example. And to a few GEV, to like five GEV, like all the dark matter tools that make use of basically Pythia tables of uh, energy spectra uh, all agree with each other. So it's perfectly fine to use them down to five GEV. But they cause problems if you like try to extrapolate it, extrapolate it to further like further down into the sub GV region. Peter, and sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you have a little bit more than six minutes in total. Okay, so you're all right, all right. And um, and the reason for that is that like uh, that you cannot go go below is that you start with an energy scale of the center of mass energy of the process followed by the part and shower, and then in the end you have an energy scale calculated in an energy scale of lambda QCD. But in the sub GE region, you start with the same energy scale as you end up with. So it's somehow you have to jump directly from annihilation to the uh, the hadronization region or the, the like meson region here. So that is not that has not been calculated or implemented into the standard dark matter tools so far. So we have a, an MEV gap here, and this is really bad news. Like we started with the standard WIMP, but found out that it's under really strong uh, tension and under indirect detection. And in the hidden sector, where we try to put indirect detection constraints, we have an MEV gap. So what is like turns out to be a big problem pretty much defines our project in the end. And that is like filling first this MEV gap to the, explore the hidden dark matter sector. And this is basically what we've done in the end, where we focused on the vector mediator on vector mediator models. So a matrix element on a vector medium model uh, looks like that. We have like an incoming um, current, a vector mediator that then couples to quarks. And you have on the right hand side an hadronic current. And the crucial part in that is that the left part uh, here is, com is depending on the model input, but the right part here, the hadronic current is completely independent of our model that we insert here on the left-hand side. So we can start with the plus e minus processes we have, where we have a lot of data, as you can see uh, here on top, and annihilate a plus e minus to a photon that then couples um, to the hadronic current. And as you can see here, we have contributions from rho a resonant contribution from rho, omega, and phi. So we have a mediator of rho, omega, and phi that then annihilate into, um, for example, two pions, three pions, four pions, and other mesons. And we can put like, uh, um, so we can collect a lot of channels, for example, the two pion channel that is then contributing to one part of the hadronic current. We can have a three pion current that is um, contributing to the rho part and the, the phi part of the hadronic current. So we collect all the contributions that contribute to the right hand side of the uh, right hand side of the process and then fix it with the uh, A plus E minus data. And then, uh, so like with a lot of uh, processes like two pions, three pions and all sorts of um, um, mesons and also baryons where we use parameterizations from the plus e minus data, either take the fits from there, or if, there, if there's more recent data, we do our own fits or fully like um, study it on our own. So having that all together, we have like that part of the current set already. So we only have to change the left-hand side for dark matter processes. So that part is fixed. The 
the ISIS spin zero part is fixed and also the strange part of the current is fixed. The only thing we have to change is the, like meta, the couplings of the vector mediator to, to the quarks in the end and also like the, uh, the other couplings in, on the left hand side. And we've done that, for example, for like photon-like couplings, where it's pretty much like the electro uh, the electromagnetic um, current, and get these energy spectra. And as you can see, it really changes a lot depending on the mass, because some channels drop out or some um, more channels take uh, part in, like for higher um, dark matter masses. And then as a second example, we use B minus L model with uh, quark couplings of one third. And as you can see here, like the isospin one part of the current completely cancels. So subdominant processes before come, become more prominent because they are the only pro uh, processes left if like that isospin one the current is uh, disappearing and some um, other processes go down in other spectra, for example. So with that, we could yeah. set like- Sorry, you have so, just uh, two minutes left in total, like- All right, I'm, I'm finished soon. So now you can set CMB constraints, for example, like they have done in uh, the Aachen people have done, and they calculated then with our uh, energy spectra the the um, the, uh, the factor that is um, used for CMB constraints, and as you can see, it really like um, closes the MEV gap um, in for CMB constraints. Constraints. So we really closed that MEV gap with an implementation, uh, implementation into Hervic, and we also provided those energy spectra for Dark Susi. So to sum up, you can use indir uh, like indirect detection as one of the leading constraints in the sub-GV range, and the hadronic final states have largely been unexplored in the sub-GV range, but we closed that gap for hadronic processes with vector mediators. And they are available within Hervic and Dark Susi. So you can now start, like that was basically the start of our project, but it's yet now more like a follow up. And now you can set constraints on indirect detection on hidden sector models in the sub GV range. And what we do right now is implementing that also into the indirect detection tool Hasma to really explore it. And yeah, let's say uh, uh, it's probably the first time I'm in the indirect detection session, but I hope it's not the last time. So thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your uh, good talk. And um, we, I don't think we have time for questions because we have a little bit more than 20 seconds. That I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I think we're landing smoothly. If people have questions, they will address them directly to you. So thank you, Peter, again. And uh, now done with this heavy subject, we go to lighter matters, neutrinos. Carlos, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Very good. Thank you very much for being there. All right, I can see you. You have the same see. hand that I have, very good. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Good. All right. So I will uh, give you a warning when you are 10 minutes in. All right. Do you see the big screen? Or the screen? There, is, there is a web or a small problem with the microphone. It's like when you speak, it cracks. Okay. You, so... wanna... hmm. you... Just, I'll just shut down mine. Actually, we can see your screen running down. So maybe you want to put it full screen. You can see a double feature in your presentation. Like, oh, how about now? No. Now I can only see white, but I suspect it's going to become... Yeah, no. Um, now... Oh, no. Hold on. No. Now it's good. And uh, also we can hear your voice better. So if we have any problem, I'll tell you. I'll shut down my mic and give you 10 minutes warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, your microphone is not good. It's like, are you using an environment microphone? Yeah, let me switch to my laptop's mic. Oops, give me a second. Um, how about now? That's better, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that sounds better. Okay. Good. 
Uh, right. Sorry for these technical difficulties. Um, are we good now? Wait a second. Uh, I can see only white. Uh, you see white? Wait, wait yeah. a second. Hold on, hold on. Okay, that's good. Go ahead. Very good. Thank you. So thank you once again. I'm sorry for those technical complications. Um, I'm going to talk about neutrinos and their matter. Um, so I'm going to talk, give you some results from the ice cream neutrino observatory, and I will just give you a very fast recap um, about the ice cube. Um, an ice cube is a gigaton scale uh, neutrino detector in the South Pole. Um, it instruments about one cubic kilometer of very clear Antarctic ice, and it's comprised of by these strings. There are 86 of these strings. The strings are separated about 125 meters horizontally and 70 meters. Uh, in the vertical direction. Uh, th that is the detectors in, in, in each train. Um, so we see the shell of light produced by charged particles in the ice. Uh, so for example, you can have a mu neutrino charge current interaction uh, in the bedrock below the detector or the ice around the detector that produces high energy muon. The high energy muon uh, emits shell of radiation with a particular uh, light pattern as you can see here. Uh, and we're looking at the spatial time, the position of this light, we can figure out the muon direction. Uh, we can also figure out the energy of these events. Uh, so this is one of our event displays. So here you can see these little chains. Those are the ice cube strings. Uh, you can see uh, some of the spheres, uh, the little dots have color. Those are PMPs that have been struck by light. Um, and the bigger the sphere, it means that they have seen more light and the smaller the sphere, uh, they have seen less light. The color indicates time. So red means earlier time, blue means later time. Um, and uh, what we do first is we figure out the direction of these events. And then we once we do that, we can measure the energy losses along this trajectory. And so happens that these very high energies, the energy losses is going to be proportional to the mu momenta. And so we can figure out the mu momenta and from that the energy. So I ask you, uh, not only is able to see mu neutrino charge current events, we can see all of the neutrino uh, flavors. Um, the mu neutrino charge current events, they made these long tracks. On those, the end resolution uh, is known within a factor of two. Most of the uncertainty comes because we actually do not know the initial interaction point uh, where the mu was produced. Um, we also, in that case, because of the long lever arm, the angular resolution uh, is good with better than one degree. Uh, we also can see charge current electron neutrinos and neutral current events. Uh, those make these uh, almost isotropic light emissions, uh, which we call cascades. And when those are contained within the detector instrumented volume, we can figure out the energy was deposited of 15% resolution. And there's a slight asymmetry in how the light is emitted, uh, and that allows us to have handle on the direction of these events. And we can figure out that with 10 degrees angular resolution at 100 degrees. We can also see tau neutrinos in an event by event basis at high energies, and that's a very special signature. So remember the colors are the times. So here, here in the rightmost panel is a neutrino. The neutrino comes from the left. It interacts somewhere in the red blob or about the center of it. It's a very boosted uh, tau that's going to decay after some macroscopic length, um, and it makes that green blob over there. To give you a sense of scale, if you have a 1 PV tau neutrino, that typically goes out 50 meters in the ice. And these kind of signatures can be resolved uh, above 100 TVs. Um, ASCUB was built and taught to look for neutrinos from cosmic beam dams. Um, we uh, recently announced uh, one of our first, our first candy neutrino source uh, by seeing an associated uh, 300 TV neutrino uh, from a flaring blazer in gamma rays uh, from the TXS uh, source. Uh, but IceCube not only has seen neutrinos, subsequent neutrinos to identification with correlation with gamma rays, we have also seen them through uh, measurements of the diffuse neutrino spectra. And today I'm going to talk about those measurements a little bit and how we use those measurements to constrain or to search for that matter. Um, the strategy here is to use high energy starting events uh, because those are going to have a higher um, percentage of astrophysical events. Uh, the, uh, the idea is then to select events that start inside the detector instrumented volume. Uh, there are going to be 60 events uh, in seven and a half years of data we have analyzed. 
of 60 TVs. And this is this is this results uh, are discussed in this recent paper that we published just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the high energy starting event, this energy distribution is shown here. Uh, it peaks somewhere are a little less than um, 100 TeVs, uh, and like I was saying, out of 60 TeVs, there are 60 of these events. 80% um, of these events are of astrophysical origin, and they fit to a power law energy distribution that's compatible with an E to the minus 2.9. Uh, in this sample, we can also study flavor composition of the neutrinos. Um, we observe the first high energy neutrino events, which we call double double. Uh, I believe that's a type of coffee. Um, and uh, in, in double double, you can see the event display here, and you can see the nearby uh, PMT uh, charge depositions as a function of time. So, what you're looking here is a double spike signature that you can see clearly in some of these panels. Um, which is characteristic of photon neutrinos. So with that, we have an updated measurement of the flavor composition of astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, now for the first time with some tau neutrino identification. And that's shown in the left plot uh, as a black lines. And what's important here is that unfortunately the errors are large and most of the flavor is still allowed, uh, but the standard flavor compositions are democratic flavor compositions, so equal flavor uh, of neutrinos at the earth. Uh, it's well within uncertainties. Uh, we have also looked into the spatial distribution of these high energy starting events. Here is the hotspots uh, of those events. Unfortunately, there are no newly identified neutrino sources with these high energy neutrinos. Um, but we can look at these uh, observables well when we look for dark matter signatures. So I want to step back for a second from those uh, measurements and think about what we can do with high energy astrophysical neutrinos. And here I have laid for you a series of or a, a collection of topics that we often talk about in beyond standard model physics and dark matter and beyond. Uh, this is, of course, not an exhaustive list. Some of the new physics is going to affect the neutrino production. For example, obviously, when you have dark matter annihilation and decay, that's a new source of neutrinos. Uh, you can also have uh, some particular new physics that's going to modify how neutrinos um, act between their sources and us. Uh, for example, relevant to this talk, normal matter neutrino interactions, but you can also have things like the symmetry relations of supernova neutrinos uh, or neutrino decay. Um, and another possibility is that you have effects that modify the neutrino interaction themselves. So for example, electroquarks or new uh, and more signatures such as monopoles. Uh, so essentially what we have is this, uh, a collection of different models and we are trying to figure out if there is anything beyond standard model present in our data by means of four different observables. So the energy distribution I showed you earlier, the direction of the neutrinos, the flavor composition, and if these are associated with um, a physical neutrino flare, like gamma rays, the time distribution compared to other messengers. So today I'm going to talk about the matter annihilation and decay. Um, and the question is essentially, do these not just come from, from dark matter? So we have performed analysis of the annihilation uh, of dark matter into neutrinos. So you can see in the bottom left plot, uh, as a function of the right ascension, the sign of declination. Um, here, our events are shown as crosses and excess. Uh, and the galactic center is that wider blob. And you can see that uh, the matter, um, dark matter signatures will be very clustered around there, and there is no obvious cluster um, in that direction. So from that, we put constraints on the annihilation rate uh, of dark matter into some more particles. And for example, here, top of muons, uh, shown on the right. Um, and these are the leading constraints in this particular energy range. I guess um, that's telling you what I wanted to tell you, that you're approximately half your time. Thank you. Thank you. Very synchronized. Um, so um, um, we also look for dark matter decay. Uh, in that case, the distribution is broader. Um, as you can see in the right plot, uh, this is because it's proportional to the column density, not the column density square. Um, and in this case, uh, this is actually um, also, we also obtain a constraint in this case, which is also the link constraint in for PV dark matter. 
You can also uh, relate these constraints to constraints on gamma rays because many of these signatures, for example, mu, mu, the mu, mu channel or other channels, will produce gamma rays. However, these gamma rays will downscatter due to um, in EVL absorption from their production to us. So it's not trivial to connect these constraints to gamma ray constraints. So I invite you to see Barbara's poster yesterday to talk about that. Um, so now let me switch topics slightly um, and talk about dark matter neutrino interaction. So now that's talking about how we can modify the neutrinos as it come from their sources to us. And so the question I want to ask here is if uh, dark matter can somehow stop neutrinos, um, which uh, usually just fly along. Um, so the idea was we pointed out in this paper here is that we have this um, a structure, it's a terrestrial neutrino flux. We know that no more than 10% of the astrophysical neutrino flux that we have seen is of galactic origin. So this terrestrial neutrino flux is coming at us um, and it can go through regions of smaller or larger than matter density. Uh, if it goes, for example, along the galactic center, like these green arrows, it's going to face a larger dark matter column den density than if it comes not through the galactic center. And so if there is an interaction between neutrinos and dark matter, what that's going to do is going to induce an anisotropy in the diffuse neutrino flux that we observe for there. And so here is another plot of our events in the sky map. This is in galactic coordinates now. So the center is the galactic center. Uh, the events are shown as crosses and excesses. No errors shown in this plot for the directions. And so the galactic center uh, is, um, sorry, the, co the color scale here is the column density of dark matter. Uh, so what you're looking here is essentially a disappearance of events from the galactic center. Uh, it does look from this plot that there are no events from the galactic center itself. Uh, but if you actually do a statistical analysis, you will find out that this is actually an isotropic distribution when you account for the errors on it. Um, um, so now uh, you can convert that isotro isotropy into, into constraints on, on, on these interactions. So given that we are in very high energies, we actually can resolve the microphysics between the dark matter and three interactions. Uh, so we do two benchmark cases. So in the right side, we do a vector interaction and the left side, it's a scalar dark matter of a fermionic mediator. Uh, and we pick them uh, as benchmark cases because they have different, very distinct energy signatures. The one on the left has this H channel processes that makes its resonance uh, energy, disappearance in energy, you can see the top plot. And so with that, we can put constraints on um, the coupling of these two diagrams. Uh, so here they are shown, it's a little complicated plots, I'm sorry. So the one on the left has the dark matter mass in the horizontal axis and the mediator mass in the vertical axis. And the color scale tells you the log of the maximum log coupling. And so you can see that we have put this purple line as shows or represents the region where the isotope constraints are the strongest and where you can find constraints from cosmology that are actually better. So there is some, some part where this is actually relevant. There are other matter structures in Ice Cube. Uh, I don't have time to talk about them. I just want to highlight uh, two things here. One is that we have a um, multi-year combination with Antares on searches for continuum from the galactic center, as shown here in red. Um, and we also have searches from dwarf galaxies, uh, air wimps, and solar wimps. The latter um, was discussed yesterday by Jeffrey Lazard in his poster, and, and you can look for details on that over there. Um, and now let me switch gears in the final points, uh, just to talk a little bit about the future. Uh, so we welcome to the IceCube family, the IceCube upgrade. Uh, so you see here the IceCube strings shown in blue in the top view. We have deep core I was talking earlier, which is our sub 100 GB inlet array. And now we have this IceCube upgrade, which has seven strings. Each string is going to have 100 um, IceCube detector or PMTs. Uh, it's fully funded uh, and approved by NSF. It will be deployed between 2023 and 2025, and it will improve our low energy neutrino um, measurements and ice characterization. So how does this look? So here I show you the, uh, an illustrative image of the IceCube upgrade. So on the left, you see our current deep core array uh, with IceCube. Um, for a 4 GB new mu neutrino, you only see these hits. With the IceCube upgrade, however, we'll have much more efficiency. So you're going to see much more of these lights uh, and we will to reconstruct this image much better. And so you can see here uh, our prospects for dark matter uh, searches in the IceCube upgrades um, uh, are shown in the 
left plot, the big left plots, and so the blue is our current constraints using deep core, and dark matter goes a pair of new mu bars, new mu's, uh, and then the red is what we expect to do with the upgrade. So most of the improvement is going to come uh, below 100 GV, as I was saying earlier, and this is because of this uh, defective area. Uh, so you can see the effective area of the ice cube upgrade on the for mu neutrinos on the bottom right plot instead of this pink uh, rectangle. Uh, so you can see that it significantly increases our capability of detecting uh, neutrinos uh, below 100 GV. To give you a sense of scale uh, within ice cube, uh, between 10 and 100 GV, in approximately 10 years of data, we have about half a million events. Um, so the take home measures, I don't have time for some questions, is that the subsequent neutrinos provide a unique way to search for dark matter. Uh, some of the strongest constraints on PV dark matter uh, decay and annihilation, and new constraints on the secret neutrino interactions. And we're also very excited for the ice upgrade, which will improve our sensitivity, especially for sub GV, sentence of GV energies. Uh, with that, I want to thank once more the organizer uh, and point you to our uh, ISQ comic books, which are now available in multiple languages, including Portuguese and, and Spanish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. And uh, you have gotten two questions, which I will read both to you, okay? I will read them now and you decide what to answer in the remaining two minutes that you will have. Concerning the dark matter annihilation, have you considered just the galactic component? The extragalactic component could spoil the strong correlation with the galactic center. First question. Second question is, are there comparisons of the amount of neutrinos detected in the sun direction, taking into account the possible extra shading effect of dark matter? Just two questions, uh, now you have two. Yeah, let me reply to the first one first. Um, and regarding the annihilation and decay, yes, we consider the both the um, the extragalactic and galactic contribution um, in the annihilation decay. In the annihilation case, the, it's mostly dominated by the galactic contribution. Um, in the decay case, however, the extragalactic contribution is much more significant. Um, and then the second question was about the sun. I didn't quite get Are that. Are there comparisons? Are there comparisons of the amount of neutrinos detected in the sun direction, taking into account the possible extra shading effect of dark matter? Though I don't know what is the extra shading effect of dark matter. I yeah. see. So you mean if I have, uh, yes, yes, I think if I see what they, they, they mean. So I guess uh, the idea would be if I have dark matter neutrino interactions and I additionally look for dark matter from the sun, you will need to have two different dark matter species, uh, one heavier, that will annihilate in the sun, and one lighter will just populate our local area. Um, my guess is that uh, that shading will be probably very small because we constrain essentially that shading, that opacity introduced by, not, by the matter neutrino interactions in astrophysical neutrinos, where the baseline is gigaparsec scale, essentially, uh, or hundreds of kiloparsecs if you only consider the galactic dark matter compared to the solar air distance. So I think that that's. Uh, that would have been seen first in astrophysical neutrinos than in for solar WIMPs. I think that's maybe the question was going, but maybe I'm, I misinterpreted. I, I think, think that's that the case. Was, I think that was the question in fact. He says, okay, that was paid off. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we're perfectly on time. Thank you very much for the great talk and the questions. Thank you for the questions. And we are right on time. Thanks for unsharing your screen. And then we pass on to Chiara. Hi. Can you hear Hello, me? Chiara. Yes, we can hear you uh, loud and clear. Very good. You know that you have a total of 15 minutes that you can split in uh, 12 plus three. We suggested split in 12 plus three, but it's entirely up to you. So I will give you a warning when you are like seven, eight, nine minutes in, so you know where to. Okay. If mm -hmm. we don't see your screen though. Yes, yes, I'm going to share now. Uh, okay. We see it, so I'll shut down oh. my microphone and let you have the stage. Okay, fine, thanks. Hi, good morning and good afternoon to, to everyone. I am Chiara Poiré, a PhD student at the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia. I'm going to present indirect searches for uh, dark matter in the astrophysical sources with the Antares and KM Trinet experiment. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, Antares and KM Trinet are two neutrino telescopes. Uh, this type of, around the world, there are four of this type of uh, experiments. Three are in the northern um, hemisphere, which are Antares and KM Trinet in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, the, the third one is in the Baikal Lake. In the southern hemisphere, we have only ice cube at the South Pole. The, this type of uh, neutrinos has three main characteristics. They need a large volume. Uh, it's necessary a transparent medium, which could be ice or water, this for the Cherenkov effect and they need, they need to be at a large depth. Um, for what concerns the transparent medium, it could be ice or water, and uh, both of them could have uh, better characteristic uh, respect to the other one. For example, in the ice, uh, there, is no, is not, uh, um, is, there is not the noise uh, of uh, uh, 40k, but uh, for example, the water is better because there is a larger scattering length. And this is good to have a better angular uh, resolution. Antares is the first underwater neutrino telescope built in the Mediterranean Sea. It is located uh, close to Toulon in France at the depth of uh, uh, to uh, 2,500 meters, and it is collecting data from 2007, and for sure it will take collect data till the end of next year. Antares is a is an array uh, made by 12 lines anchored on the sea floor. Each of these line, in each of these lines, there are 25 stories, which are uh, this structure, uh, every, there are floors in the picture you can see, are 25 floors. And each of these, uh, in each of these stories, there are three PM PMTs. So this, in this array, we have uh, around 900 PMTs that look the sea floor. KM Trinet, uh, let me say, is the evolution of Antares. Is, uh, it is under construction and uh, it is located in two different sites. Uh, we can distinguish the, the site of, of Arca, uh, which is close to Capopassero in, in Italy, uh, at a depth of uh, 3,500 meters, more or less, and uh, the site of Orca, which is uh, close to the Antares site. In the picture, uh, in, in, on the right uh, side of this slide, so you can see the a scheme, a scheme of a uh, block of this experiment. ARCA is made by two blocks and the goal of uh, this uh, experiment is catch low fluxes of uh, neutrino from astrophysical, astrophysical sources. And the main goal of ORCA is study the oscillation and the mass ordering with using the atm atmospheric neutrinos. Both sites are suitable for dark matter searches. Um, <clears throat> Um, the, this, uh, these experiments uh, look, are looking for different uh, sources uh, for dark matter. One uh, important and uh, source where to look is the galactic center, because there are different models that predict that there is a large dark matter density. Uh, 
For these experiments, uh, the flux of neutrinos expected in the detector depends on the type of the source, which is um, considered in the J factor, and uh, it uh, takes in consideration the annihilation rate inside the source. Um, for Antares, the, um, the analysis uh, in, uh, in the galactic center, uh, to do the analysis in the uh, galactic center, it is necessary to estimate the sensibility of the experiment. Uh, to do this, uh, um, it is used an unbinned likelihood method. And to calculate this likelihood, um, it's necessary to know the background and the signal. The, the background is estimated from real data. Uh, instead, the signal is, uh, is, given, is uh, given by the energy distribution, which is calculated by the program PPPC4, and uh, the source morphology density, which is uh, included in the J factor. Uh, here uh, we can see the limits for uh, of uh, 11 years of data taking for uh, Antares and uh, simulation of the sensitivities for KM3 net arc. In the plot on your uh, left, we can see the comparison between 11 years uh, of data taking Antares, the limits of uh, uh, 11 years of Antares, and uh, uh, the simulation of the phase one of uh, ARCA, one year of uh, lifetime. Uh, phase one of ARCA means that there are, are considered only 24 lines. And we can see that uh, uh, we have uh, very comparable results. If yeah, we sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you, have, you have a bit more than six minutes in total, OK? okay. A little bit more. But, uh, uh, in the right, uh, right plot, uh, we can see the uh, comparison between Antares 11 years of data taking and uh, the simulation of full ARCA, which consists in uh, 230 lines and one year of uh, life. And we can see that there is a, fa a factor, more or less 10 improvement for with full ARCA. So we have better results with just one year of data taking. Here, um, a comparison between Antares, 11 years of data taking, KM3 net uh, full ARC, one year of life, compared with similar experiment as Ice Cube and uh, different experiment. Uh, Antares also uh, include in his analysis models which are different from WIMP models. And uh, here there are the limits uh, calculated for uh, this secluded scenarios that uh, um, provide mass in range from 10 to 100 TV. Another interesting uh, massive sources for search dark matter is the sun. This source is uh, sensitive to dark matter nucleon cross section and uh, respect the galactic center, it has a, a very clean uh, signal. The, the analysis for, uh, for dark matter searches in the sun is, uh, is similar to the analysis done in the galactic center, except that instead of use the program PPPC4, it is used WIMP-SIM, which is uh, um, specific for the sun. Again, the analysis is similar. It is used an unbinned likelihood method, uh, which needs background and signal. The signal is uh, calculated by the WIMP-SIM. 
and the background is uh, calculated from real data. Here we have um, results for uh, what concern Antares data taking only five years from 2007 to 2012 and five years simulated for what concern KM3 network compared uh, with other experiments. And we have the two cases of spin dependent and spin dependent. Also, uh, the analysis of Antares include a search for secluded dark matter in the sun. Um, there's, uh, there's models uh, consider the annihilation uh, rate and the, um, the time decay, decay of the mediators uh, uh, that produce neutrinos. Here we have uh, the, the results of these different models uh, in Antares compared with uh, other uh, different experiment. In conclusion, uh, indirect search for uh, dark matter is uh, very interesting for neutrino telescopes. We can say that Antares puts limits for wind masses in a range of 50 GV to 100 TV. Uh, it's also important to have a uh, um, comparison between direct detection experiments and these uh, indirect detection experiments uh, to compare them in the different uh, uh, astrophysical sources for dark matter. And we can say that KM3Net has from the simulation, very competitive sensitivities. Uh, what's the future of these two experiments? Uh, for what concern Antares, uh, the analysis is under progress and uh, the, the experiment will take data for sure, for the moment, uh, till the end of next year. Uh, and the last year of data taking are under, uh, under analysis. For what concern uh, KM3Net, uh, well, uh, there are the first six months of uh, data taking of uh, KM3Net ARC, and so they are ready to be analyzed. And uh, it will be very important to have a combined analysis with um, other type of experiments. Uh, that's all. Thanks for the, for the attention. Thank you very much for the talk, Chiara. So we're looking forward to see the combined analysis with the other types of experiments. Um, you are perfectly on time, meaning that there's uh, approximately 20 seconds as of now to your total time. So I would say that if someone has questions for Chiara to address, her, to address the questions directly to Chiara, either through the chat or through her email address, that should be publicly available where you can ask her. And uh, Chiara, thank you again. And can I ask you to unshare your screen and get, sorry, that's your timer, and get to the last speaker of this uh, session and while staying with neutrinos. Ibrahim, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Good, great. Now I can see Ibrahim. All right. And my screen? Uh, we can see you. Your screen is clearly up because you're looking up with respect to the laptop to your laptop's camera, but we cannot see what you are seeing on the screen. Okay. Uh, now we can. And if you share it, very good. Okay, so as with the other speakers, I will give you a notice when you're approximately half the way, half time, and then it's up to you, all right? Sounds uh, good. You go ahead. All right, thank you. So, um, hello everyone, I'm Brahim, and I'll, I'll talk to you today about um, this, this paper that I link here uh, that was uh, recently submitted to the um, Review of Modern uh, Physics. And in that, we look at uh, dark matter annihilation uh, to direct neutrino pairs. 
And uh, I hope I can convince you that that is necessary in the search for, for uh, WIMPs. Um, I will not uh, waste too much time describing the evidence for, uh, for dark matter, but I will stress uh, that there are, there are hints uh, for a particle nature of dark matter from the bullet cluster and, and dwarf spher uh, spheroidal galaxy observations. And um, the WIMP is the simplest um, uh, um, weak scale uh, particle uh, that we can hypothesize uh, to explain uh, these observations. And although it might be too simplistic, uh, we need to uh, explore it completely in order to either uh, discover it or, or, or rule it out. And so in the WIMP scenario, you just have uh, to uh, or a dark matter particle and uh, a new force, and uh, it uh, talks to the standard model um, through this new force, and then you can detect it via the standard model products. Uh, and so, more generally, if you if if we look at this um, pseudo Feynman diagram, um, you'll see that in the end you you'll always get uh, either gamma rays uh, charged particles, and if they're far enough, they'll always also give you gamma rays and uh, neutrinos. And the truly invisible channel is, is the uh, neutrino pair channel, uh, wherein you will see no uh, charged particles or uh, gamma rays, unless, of course, uh, they're at high enough energy where they can, uh, they can radiate gamma rays. But um, for the most part, this is the, an invisible channel, and it's been sort of a blind spot for the indirect searches for dark matter that we need to uh, uh, constrain in order to say that we have fully explored the WIMP uh, hypothesis. And so given that all standard model finals, uh, all final states lead to photons or neutrinos, and, um, and that there are models that, that have been proposed that I link here uh, that uh, link the dark sector with um, of the standard model through a, a neutrino portal, wherein uh, you, you will not get any other uh, uh, signatures, uh, it's important to, uh, again, uh, constrain the, the, the annihilation to neutrino pairs. Now, of course, uh, to find dark matter, uh, first you must detect the neutrinos. And in the neutrino community, we've been uh, blessed over the last uh, few decades, as you can see, since the, the 80s, I show here uh, an active volume as a function of time. And you can see the development in the, in the, in the detector technology has really allowed us to, to, to go up to about, with ice cube, about 10 to the 12 uh, kilograms um, in, in active uh, volume. Um, there, you know, I, I, I put a bunch of other experiments here that we've, uh, we've, we've looked at for this work. Um, and I think this is, this is very promising um, for dark matter searches, especially in the last uh, decade or so, we've been able to collect uh, a lot of data. Now, um, the, the signatures, uh, the standard model, you know, uh, the fluxes that we expect uh, to hit these detectors uh, range from this, the CNU B at the lowest energies all the way up to uh, astrophysical extragalactic neutrinos at the highest energies. And now we have been able, with the exception of the GZK uh, flux and the CNU B, so the lowest and the highest energy neutrino fluxes, we have basically um, measured or um, uh, constrained um, uh, most of these uh, fluxes. And so we're gonna use these uh, to do line searches uh, with, with different experiments. In total for this, uh, for this work, we've looked at about 19 neutrino experiments, both current and proposed. Um, starting at the lowest energies, I, I just list a few here, but uh, there's an exhaustive table and the list uh, in the paper. Um, Borexino at the lowest energies, it's, it's mostly geoneutrinos, but it's also sensitive uh, to, to solar neutrinos at the MEV scale. And so we can convert those upper limits to, to upper limits on, on uh, dark matter annihilation. Uh, Antares, uh, which you just uh, uh, heard uh, a talk about, uh, so I will not uh, go into details, but it can measure atmospheric neutrinos uh, from in the GeV to TeV range. Uh, OJ, which is um, a cosmic ray experiment, but also has uh, set competitive limits on, on EEV neutrinos. Um, for uh, future experiments, we have Dune upcoming, Hyper-K, uh, Juno, um, you know, Grand at the EEV scale, and then, and then Tambo, which is, uh, uh, I'll talk about that in detail in a little bit. 
So not only do we have a, a plethora of experiments right now, but we have a, an upcoming new generation of neutrino experiments that will go further along in, in, uh, in accurately measuring the fluxes uh, in question. So to focus a little bit on, on Tembo, which is, um, I say coming to a valley uh, near you because it's it's uh, uh, the the site uh, that is proposed is in the Colca Valley in Peru. So that is um, one of the deepest and narrowest uh, at the same time valleys in in the world, and this allows us to uh, to probe a very specific interaction, which is the tau neutrino interaction, uh, charge current tau neutrino interaction, because at order one to one hundred PeV, the tau decay length becomes uh, a, a on the order of a, a 100 meters to a kilometer. If you use a, a very narrow uh, um, uh, valley and then put Trinkoff detectors on the side of, a, of the cliff and then wait for an air shower uh, to come out of the mountain, uh, there's no other signature that can give you this because uh, muons will be blocked by all of the rock. Uh, and then um, the, the taus uh, will decay uh, in the air before uh, hitting the other side of the mountain. And so this is a very um, effective way of measuring tau neutrinos. Tembo will be able to, uh, I think we'll have an effective area 10 times larger than, than Ice Cube, though it has a very limited uh, uh, field of view, um, but uh, it promises to determine um, the, the cutoff energy of astrophysical neutrinos, as well as measure a pure uh, tau neutrino astrophysical flux. Uh, another uh, experiment that's uh, that's coming soon that that is also relevant to this work is is CTA and that's an air Cherenkov detector uh, that will have a ten times better sensitivity and accuracy over over the current generation of gamma ray experiments, and uh, the plan is to have more than hundred telescopes in both hemispheres and I show here the the, the proposed sites in the top right. But hey, sorry to interrupt you. You are just a bit above. You you have a little bit more than six minutes. Uh, okay as total time, okay? Sure. All right, Andrew. Um, and so uh, CTA will be sensitive to dark matter annihilation to, to neutrino pairs because at a certain energy, uh, neutrinos start radiating gammas. And so uh, CTA will have sensitivity uh, to the neutrino channel via uh, gamma rays uh, radiated by neutrinos. And so um, the annihilation signal, uh, you know, could be, seen from the galactic center, um, which depends on the, on the average cross-section, the thermal average cross-section, the neutrino production spectrum, which here we assume is a, is a delta function because we're looking at neutrino pairs. And then the, the, the so-called J factor, which is just the integral of the, of the density of dark matter over the line of sight. And for this work, we use a generalized NFW profile that has, um, that is fit for um, specific parameters for the for the NFW profile using uh, uh, data data driven techniques. For the extra galactic contribution, um, you also expect, of course, an isotropic neutrino signal coming from all other halos in the universe, um, and so that flux uh, depends on, of course, the Hubble expansion. Uh, the production spectrum is now. Um, uh, converted to a, a Z dependent delta function um, because your just your your energy is just being redshifted, and now uh, you have an extra uh, factor uh, which is called the halo boost factor, and that is just uh, the integral not only of a single halo but of the distribution of halos as a function of mass and redshift. And so uh, there are uncertainties here on the order of, of about uh, an order of magnitude from the from the highest to the lowest. Uh, and we include those in our um, measurements in our, I'm sorry, in our limits. And so, you know, we have the neutrinos. Uh, this is the expected a dark a neutrino flux from dark matter. And uh, that's what it should look like for here. We superimpose it on um, examples that are super K and ice cube, uh, nu mu and nu e unfolded. Uh, atmospheric spectra, and then the uh, astrophysical uh, ice cube uh, spectrum on the, on the bottom right. All right, so um, before we dive in, these are the, these are the, the, the main results here, but um, I'll just point out a, a couple of things. So uh, any line here that has a, a, a heart next to the label, that is one that's been produced for this work specifically. Uh, where there is a, a specific citation that is a, a, an independent group that has made this uh, a limit and where there is 
uh, no citation and, and, and no heart. That is a, um, a collaboration uh, official uh, um, result. And so uh, you see the thermal rel uh, relic abundance um, and we're actually very uh, happy to see that we're, we're indeed getting much closer to the thermal relic abundance than we thought was possible uh, just uh, a decade ago. And uh, specifically at the lowest energies here, um, I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. You'll see Borxino, Camland, and then uh, SuperK um, has several different, different data sets. So we do different analyses based on uh, what data set we have. And so the, in, in green, this is the diffuse supernova background search. And so these produced upper limits and we converted those uh, to upper limits on the, on the annihilation cross section. And that is ever so close to the thermal relic abundance. And we think maybe in the, in the next generation, uh, we'll probably uh, get there. Uh, Juno uh, will also have uh, very competitive sensitivity in the future, uh, as well as Hyper-K and, and Dune. So that's, that's very exciting. At the very high energies, although we are violating the unitarity bound, um, we derive these upper limits nonetheless. Um, and uh, as you can see in this, in this um, range, uh, Tambo, uh, the high energy ice cube analyses, uh, uh, Grand and, and uh, Auger um, will also uh, be able to constrain uh, dark matter annihilation, although it's pretty far from the thermal relic expectation. Uh, we've also uh, derived these limits for velocity dependent uh, annihilation. So there, there's the, uh, in the expansion, the, the V squared term here. Um, and uh, in this case, we're so far off from the thermal relic that you can't see it on the plot, but, um, but uh, we are making progress nonetheless, but hopefully the dark matter does not um, interact through this channel primarily. And we did the same for the D-wave annihilation. So that's the V to the fourth term. Uh, and you know the limits are even weaker in that case, uh, as expected. Uh, just to inform you that you have just above a minute. Ah, you're, you're sorry. Yep, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna summarize here quickly. So we don't understand the nature of dark matter or how it's connected to the standard model, but we know that there is new physics in the neutrino sector and um, Although the searches for dark matter with, with gamma rays and charged particles are more constraining, uh, we need to also, uh, let's say, corner the dark matter uh, by looking at uh, the neutrino uh, pair uh, channel. And so in this work, we updated uh, limits and derived new ones uh, all the way from the MEV to the, to the ZEV range. And then hopefully the next generation experiments uh, will dip their toes in the thermal relic abundance region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, for the very interesting talk. Um, there is a little bit more than 30 seconds left. So if there is any urgent question that can be answered quickly. Um, one, two, three. Then otherwise, I would thank Ibrahim and all the speakers of this first session again. And um, all right. So before switching on to the next session, um, I hope you can see me. Uh, I would like again to thank all the speakers of the first session again. Now Enrico will be the chair of the next session. And while you, uh, he gets the other speakers set up, let me share, it's perfect. Let me share the latest version of the playlist that I promised to update every day. It contains